Hello and welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. I am so happy to be back doing a podcast with you this week. We had a little interim there where I was in Poland and then I was on vacation with my nanny family and I ended up real sick. So we are back in, um, in work, in working form. And I wanted to do a podcast here at the beginning of Advent, specifically on the topic of light, um, Christ as our light. And so I chose here my nativity set that I have enlightened with a lot of little light bulbs. Um, but it's only to remind us of Christ who is coming, who is our light and who wants to enlighten the darkness of our lives and to make us instruments of his light in the world. And since I am still a little bit ill, I'm not able to sing. Um, but I thought that we would begin with this prayer, this poem, um, that sometimes we pray in the Office of Readings. It's by John Henry Newman, Lead Kindly Light. And it's always been one of my very favorite um, options in Christian prayer. Um, I love this prayer. I love this poem. And so we'll begin with that, and then we'll just kind of go through Scripture on light and what the Lord is trying to speak to us this Advent season. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we will be recreated and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Come, sweet Jesus, the light of the world, our little star pointing us to heaven, the radiance of the Father's love made visible for us on earth. We ask you, sweet Jesus, to pour the ocean of your light and your love upon us in this next hour, upon me as I speak, and upon all those that you draw to listen to this podcast. We ask that more than the words that we meditate on, that we may experience your light in our lives, the effects of your light in our lives. We ask that we can prepare for this great gift that you're giving to us this year at Christmas. And we ask this all in your holy name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who came as that light of fire, that light of love. Lead kindly light, lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou should lead me on. I loved to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I loved the garish day. In spite of fears, pride ruled my will. Remember not past years. So long thy power hath blessed me, sure is still will lead me on. Or moor and fen, or crag and torrent till the night is gone. And with the morn, those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since and lost a while. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark, and I am far from home, lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see, the distance seen, one step enough for me. And we ask our lady who emptied her entire heart, her entire life to make room for the light of the world to consume her, to pray that we can imitate her in this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. As I was rushing around my house yesterday, putting up Christmas decorations, <laughs> I was getting so excited about the light about the lights that I had over my mantle around Our Lady and on the trees and on the, the railing going upstairs and on my little tree. I don't have a big tree yet. The lights I put around the Christ child and the different creches. And especially here, it's, it's such a beautiful nativity scene. And I found it at Costco, believe it or not. And I was so excited to open it and then to be able to insert the little bulbs behind it to enlighten Christ. And the Lord began to really speak to me about his gift of coming this Christmas as light. I think that word is going to really um, uh, resonate with me throughout all of Advent. Not only as Christ as being my light, but Christ as inside of me being the light to others, right? Christ came as the light of the world at Christmas in order to cast out darkness. You know, at the very beginning of, um, of scripture, we hear about the creation of the world. And it says that the world was like this wasteless, dark form. And the first thing God created was light. Let there be light, right? Fiat luz is what the Father said. Let there be light. Because in God, there is no darkness. Everything is transparent. Everything is life-giving. And the light of God is um, constant, uh, is the same, sorry, I have words in my head I can't pronounce, <laughs> um, uh, is the same as his, his life and his light, right? His, his life was light, we'll read from John. And so when God breathed his life into this world, right, into creation, eventually into man, he was breathing his light into them, a divine light which is very, very beautiful. Christmas is on the darkest day of the year. And I think that, you know, in all of salvation history, that wasn't a coincidence because God wanted to show no matter what kind of darkness entered the world, darkness entered through sin, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, they were blocked out of that garden of light, the garden of Eden. And sin brings obscurity and darkness and fear and uncertainty, right? And yet Christ doesn't leave us alone in that darkness. In fact, he enters it. He enters it in Christmas. He entered it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes back into that darkness to bring the light of his love and his faith and his trust and his salvation. And that's where we eventually get the light of the resurrection. These mysteries are all connected, right? Bethlehem and the cross and the resurrection and eternity. And so Jesus comes on this darkest of days, and he comes in obscurity, he comes in darkness, he comes in rejection, he comes hidden away in poverty, in a stable behind an inn where nobody would take him in, in the cold, right? That prayer of St. Andrew that we pray through for the 25 days leading up to Christmas is, you know, the Christ child, we remember him coming, you know, in a cold stable, alone, at midnight, you know, in darkness, right? But there's a great um, miracle of grace and of warmth and of light and of life that's given to us in the midst of this darkest moment. And that's of the Christ child. And it's shown to us by that star. You know, we take for granted that on top of Christmas trees, we have a star. But there's a reason for that, because God determined to have a star shine so brightly over that stable in Bethlehem that even Gentiles that weren't prepared by, you know, the Jewish law and all of that could follow that star and could find Christ, that the shepherds would come. Christ comes to be our light 
in the midst of darkness. So if you have a place in your life that's full of darkness, that's a little bit obscure, then that's the perfect place for Christ to be born. And he wants to come with that fire of his love, which is light. And it gives clarity to our doubt. It gives warmth to where we're cold. It gives comfort to where people are uh, disconcerted, especially in this world. So many people are worried about so many different things. And it's because they look at the world. They're not looking at heaven. So Christ came with that star in the sky to point us to heaven. And he dwelt among us. And then he suffered, he died, he rose, and he ascended to keep our eyes in heaven. If your eyes are on the eternal light of Christ, then you'll never have a reason to fear anything. So I wanted to, at the beginning, go through a few of the passages in Isaiah and then from the Gospels that have to do with Christ as coming as our great light. Isaiah sec number two says, In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. Think about that stable in Bethlehem being high up on a hill, right? The cross being up on a hill. The heart of Jesus in the Eucharist up on the altar in a monstrance before us, right? Jesus is hung before us up high so that our eyes are raised to him and his light can fill us and can guide us, can be like, um, can be like uh, a lighthouse. You know, when you have a ship that's lost on a, on a stormy sea, the lighthouse shows them where to go. Christ's heart is that lighthouse for us that guides us to heaven. So in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established as the highest mountain raised above the hills and all the nations shall stream toward it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the Lord's mountain. This is the Lord's mountain, Bethlehem, the city of bread, the city of angels. Let us go to the Lord's mountain, to the house of the God of Jacob that he may instruct us in his ways and we may walk in his paths. The purpose of Christ's coming is to be our light, to enlighten a path for us to get to heaven. For from Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, the words of Christ themselves are light to us, right? Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He shall judge between the nations and set terms for the peoples. So the word of Christ enlightens us. And yes, it judges us. But it judges us in mercy and it enlightens where we're erroneous so that we can be corrected and still make it into heaven. It's an act of mercy that when we are corrected by the Lord. Called to, to repent or to change in some way. It's an act of healing of our hearts. It's like a parent saying to a child, no, 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 don't go that way. You won't end up where you want. you got to come this way. You have to do it this way, right? Christ is a gentle shepherd, a gentle teacher. He'll judge between the nations and set terms for the peoples. It will be just and merciful. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They'll go from fighting with each other to when they see that light of Christ to working in his vineyard, to try to bear a great harvest of souls for him. One nation will not raise a sword against another, nor will they train for war again. House of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the purpose of Christ coming to us as the little, the little light, right? The Christ child is the little light. Imagine his heart beating in Bethlehem. And just rays of heavenly light, like a window into heaven coming out of him and pulsating, right? That's the same heart that we receive in the Eucharist, that we see upon the altar. It's a window into heaven. It's a light to, um, to heal us, to convert us, and to strengthen us on our way back home.
I also wanted to share On that day, the branch of the Lord will be beauty and glory. When the Lord comes in light, you can't look at something that's full of light and not see beauty, right? This Christmas crash was beautiful, but the light makes it resplendent. Light helps you to see the little corners and crevices that you've never maybe noticed before. When you look at a crucifix, a crucifix enlightened by a candle, you see those shadows of Christ's crucified love that you may not have noticed before. And Christ comes to earth as light to enlighten to us the love of the Father that we may have overlooked. On that day, the branch of the Lord will be beauty and glory. We will be made beautiful by his light. The fruit of the land will be honor and splendor for the survivors of Israel. Everyone who remains in Zion and who remains in Christ, right? Everyone left in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone inscribed for life in Jerusalem. If we follow the path of life and of light, we will be called holy. We will be children of heaven. When the Lord washes away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purges Jerusalem's blood from her midst with a blast of judgment and a searing blast, then will the Lord create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her place of assembly, a smoking cloud by day and a light of flaming fire by night. So the Lord wants to wash us through the gift of his precious blood and then to guide us through a flaming fire in our night. For over all, and this fire is his glory. For over all, his glory will be shelter and protection. He does this to protect us, to defend us from the evil one. Shade from the parching heat of day and refuge and cover from the storm and rain. That's why Christ came in Bethlehem. And one of the most famous passages here from Advent is Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness, that's you and I who have fallen in sin after our baptism. We've seen a great light. Upon those who lived in a land of gloom, look around the earth at all of the sin and all of the war, all of the suffering. It is a land of gloom. But for those who lived in a land of gloom, a light has shone. And the light is in the heart of baby Jesus. We can find this heart of baby Jesus in children, in his littlest ones here on earth, and in the Eucharist in a particular way. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. Christ came as our light, not so that we'll shy away from him in fear, but so that we're full of joy, so that we can take part in his glory. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at harvest as they exalt when dividing spoils. There's so many gifts that we receive from the light of Christ. They're innumerable. And we receive these gifts like we're dividing spoils in war, right? As Christ conquers the darkness, not only of the world in general, but of our own personal lives. For the yoke that burdened them, the pole on their shoulder, the rod of the taskmaster you have smashed is on the day of Midian. For every boot that trampled in battle, every cloak rolled in blood will be burnt as fuel for fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. Upon his shoulder, dominion rests. They name him Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. That's what Christ our light comes to bring us. He comes as a wonder counselor to guide us, as a God hero to save us, as a father forever to comfort, to nurture us, and as our prince of peace. His dominion is vast and forever peaceful. Upon David's throne and over his kingdom, which he confirms and sustains, by judgment and justice, both now and forever. 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So beautiful. And we see most particularly this gift of Christ is coming as our light when we read the gospel accounts of his birth. They are covered in these analogies of light, right? These symbols of light. Um, and it's interesting how Joseph wanted to divorce Mary quietly. There was a darkness in his life. He didn't understand the Annunciation. He didn't understand his place in Our Lady suddenly being pregnant, not by him, and being, you know, engaged to be married to him. And yet it was in that darkness of his confusion, of his doubt, of his unknowing, that God came as light. He sent his angel, an angel of light, angel of Gabriel, to tell him not to fear. Not to fear this gift of the little light of the Christ child within the womb of Mary. And as Joseph received this message of light from heaven, it completely transformed him. And he took Our Lady and he was faithful, risking everything even willing to flee into Egypt to protect his son. It says, now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about when his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention. When behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it's through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. As soon as Joseph was drawn into this plan of Christ our light, he was given the strength of light to know what he was supposed to do, and, and he was able to fulfill it. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said, Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore a son and named him Jesus. But this, um, this image of light in Matthew does not stop there. It continues on because when Jesus is born, it's Matthew that speaks about the star that appears in the heavens and the wise men that follow it. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising and have come to do him homage. Right? And this was to fulfill what the prophet had said, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people of Israel. So they followed the star, right? He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search diligently for the child. After their audience with the king, they set out, and behold, the star they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened the treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country another way. Look at this beauty, um, this beautiful example of the star that leads to Jesus, who is the star. That light of the Bethlehem star is only a small fraction of the light that was coming from the heart of Christ when they entered that stable. Imagine the blinding light coming from that child, from his eyes, from his breath, from his presence. And that light of the Christ child was not only manifest in a star, but it was manifest in the heavens. It was manifest in the angels and how the angels appeared to the shepherds singing glory to God in the highest. That was also a reflection, a, a small reflection of the great radiance of heavenly glory that was coming forth from that tiny, hidden, poor, humble babe in the manger. Luke says, 
In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quintarius, the governor of Syria, all went to be enrolled, each to his own town. And Joseph, too, went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David that's called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who is with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to have her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in that region, living in the fields, keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angels praising God and singing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom our favor rests. When the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go then to Bethlehem to see the thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they too followed the star. They too went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about the child and all who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. Mary kept these things reflecting on them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. We see again a manifestation of that light of Christ to the shepherds, in addition to the wise men. And this light um, was almost like a voice. It spoke, and that's why it says that Our Lady was able to ponder this and treasure it in her heart. There was an intangible message of God, an experience of his presence in all of these situations, something that was, um, you know, not definable and not, um, not tangible, really, that just ever dwelled within Our Lady, that slowly helped her to understand God's great plan of coming to the world as the light of the world, right? Just as at the beginning of time, God said, let there be light. And there was light here in this world that had fallen from God in sin. He said again through his son, Jesus, let there be light. Let there be light. And it didn't come in an easy way. It came when they were not at home, not accepted by their people. Their life even sought after in great poverty, in great simplicity, in great hiddenness. Those are the areas of our lives where we want to look for that light of Christ to win, to conquer. And what does the light of Christ do? It doesn't only um, teach us like a word. Um, it doesn't only show us a path to heaven. But it warms us when we're cold. It strengthens us when we're weak. It heals us when we're sick. It gives us that virtue of hope. It brings peace. It brings wholeness and totality. It brings union with God. Because the greater a light, the light of Christ is within us, the less that the world and the flesh and the devil can have any aspect of those areas of our hearts, of our lives. So when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, it's very important that we ask that his, life, his light to penetrate every area, even the areas you're embarrassed about, even the areas of your heart and your life that you're ashamed of or that you are afraid to let God near. Those are the places that need his redeeming light, his redeeming love. And remember that he comes as this little, gentle, tiny baby that doesn't want to hurt us. His kingly, shepherdly heart is an infant heart. It's a gentle light. 
one that comes to only bring life with it. We read about this in John. He so beautifully writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, right? So when, they, when God said, let there be light, that happened through Christ our light. All things came to be through him, and without him, nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The world could live without the sun before it could live without Jesus and his presence in the Eucharist among us. Because his life is the light of the human race. His light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Any time that you are overwhelmed by fear of your own life or the evil in the world, I invite you to take this, this, um, this stiha, I think in Russian sometimes, this stanza, this, um, from John 1, number 5, and repeat it 10 times to yourself. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man named John was sent from God, and he came for testimony. He to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Christ did not come for the few. He came for everyone. He came for the Gentiles like the kings. He came for the Jews like the shepherds. He came for all of us to enlighten our way to heaven. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him, but the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. The more that you identify with Christ as the light, the more people may shy away from you. People might not accept you because if they didn't accept Christ, why would they accept you who are a tabernacle of his light? But don't fear when that happens. His light will conquer darkness. And the closer you draw into union with him, the less that any of that matters. Your job is to focus on him and to shine his light. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. He shares that light with us as children of light. To those who believe in his name, who were born not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by man's decision, but of God. And the word became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. We saw his glory, we saw his light, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Jesus himself talks about his role as the light of the world. He said, that even though he was light, people were going to reject him. That the apex of his gift of being this great light would be when he's lifted to the cross. And he's explaining this to Nicodemus later on here in John 3. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. He knew that he would be that light lifted on a lampstand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might, not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be safe through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the verdict. The light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to the light because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come toward the light, so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. And it was just a little bit later when, oops, I just lost my markers. <laughs> But it was just a little bit later here. Let me see. In John 9, where Jesus heals the man born blind, where he says that he is that light of the world, he's healing the physical blindness of this man. But he's doing it um, to show us that he came to heal our spiritual blindness. He came to be a light that's greater than the physical ability to see. To be a light that, that guides our heart to heaven. Jesus said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he spit on the ground and he made a mud paste and he healed the vision. I came into the world for judgment, Jesus said, so that those who do not see might see and those who do see might become blind. For those who are searching for, um, honestly searching for the path to heaven, Christ comes as this light to open that path for us. But for those who are being conniving and trickery, you know, full of trickery, um, deceitful, those who are clinging to the world and their ways of expedient, you know, business ways of doing things, then the light of Christ is so bright that it blinds them and they can no longer see because they're not used to that kind of a light. They're used to a false light. So Christ himself says, I did come to give light to those who honestly want to see with the light of heaven. But those who might have a dirtied intention, they will become blind by my presence. But he comes as the light of the world to be our good shepherd, he continues there naturally in chapter 10. He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me, whoever enters through my light will be saved and will come and go out and find pasture, they'll find heaven. A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came so they might have life and have it more abundantly. And like we heard in John, the life that Christ brings us is the life of light. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not the shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and is no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know mine and mine know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep, right? It's beautiful when you meditate on the um, stations of the cross and and, you know, those narrow little roads through Jerusalem that Jesus traveled on his way to Calvary. The footprints that he left for us to follow are bloody footprints, but light comes from that blood. Christ laid down his life to create a highway of light for us to heaven. And so we shouldn't fear the cross when following the Christ child leads us to the cross. We're reminded of that in the transfiguration of Jesus. In this story, Christ is discussing his upcoming passion with Moses and Elijah. He's talking about his suffering and death. But 
The suffering and death will be such an instrument of the salvation of all of humankind that a blinding divine light comes from him. He's completely transfigured. It says, after the days Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. It's one of the few times in scripture where Christ visibly makes, you know, he physically makes visible that light that he always is, right? He usually hides that divinity from us, but we see it here. Behold, you know, we see it in Bethlehem, in the star, and in the angels, in the, in the light up sky, right? But we see it here in Christ himself. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it's not good that we're, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents, one for you, for Moses and Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. From the cloud came a voice that said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid that Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. Look at this. This light of Christ was so blinding. It kind of, um, it made Peter stand in awe where he wanted to keep it. He wanted to make a tent, right? Like, let's make a permanent shrine. And yet it knocked him to the ground because it was so great. Think about when Jesus appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus. That light blinded him and he fell off his horse because the light of Christ is powerful, right? And yet it's healing. It healed Paul's heart and made him from Saul into Paul. It converted him. Here it strengthened Peter, James, and John so that when they saw that contradiction of the cross, even their own weakness in, in denying or failing Christ in the cross, but they wouldn't be afraid because they know the power of his resurrected love as seen in the transfiguration. We see that same blinding light in the resurrection miracles when a blinding light came from Christ. That's the same light that comes at Christmas hidden in the Christ child. It's, his heart is almost like a little seed being planted. And the more that we nurture that relationship with him, the more his light naturally grows. Christ comes as our light, not so that we cling to light here on earth, but so that our eyes are turned to heaven and that we remember that we're created to be children of God, that we are created for our heavenly home, homeland, that the purpose of our life is not here on earth. It's eternally, it's eternity, right? And at the end of time, Christ will come in, in this bright radiance of heavenly light. Here he comes hidden as a Christ child so that we don't fear him, so that we welcome him into our darkness. But it's not so that we stay in the darkness. It's so that we allow him to free us into heaven, so that we can stand in that brilliant um, throne room with him before the Father, praising the Trinity for all of eternity in that new Jerusalem. It's to draw us away from the mundane of this world to that which never fades. And so we'll read here from Revelation a little bit. Then I saw the heavens opened and there was a white horse and its rider was called Faithful and True. Jesus is faithful and true. He judges and wages roar in, war in righteousness. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and on his head were many diadems. He had a name inscribed that no one knows except himself. He wore a cloak that had been dipped in blood, and his name was the Word of God. So that brilliance that comes from him comes from his own blood. So as we wash ourselves in his blood, when we go to confession in preparation for Christmas, every day that we receive him at Mass, we're washing ourselves in his light. The armies of heaven followed him, mounted on white horses and wearing clean white linen. 
Out of his mouth came a sharp sword to strike the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He himself will tread out in the winepress, the wine of the fury and the wrath of God the Almighty. He has a name written on his cloak and on his thigh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what Christ will be in the fullness of his glory. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Bethlehem is just a little window into this. I also saw the holy city a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And we're prepared for Christ our husband by following his laws, by following that path of virtue that he plants within our hearts as he comes at Christmas. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold God's dwelling places with the human race. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. He'll stoop from heaven to our obscurity so that we can be raised back up to heaven with him. God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, no more mourning, wailing, or pain. For the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne, who is Christ our light, said, Behold, I make all things new. Then he said, Write down these words, for they are trustworthy and true. He said to me, they are accomplished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I give a gift from the spring of life-giving water. We get to drink of that, that water of light that comes from his heart. Think about that image of St. Faustina, Jesus, I trust in you. You see coming from Christ's heart, blood and water, but it almost looks like light. Every time you go to confession, every time you go to communion, you are being given a drink from the light that comes from the side of Christ. The victor will inhabit these gifts, and I will be his God, and they, he will be my son. But as for cowards, the unfaithful, the deprived, murderers, unchaste, sorcerers, idol worshippers, and deceivers of every sort, their lot is in the burning pool of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. One of the seven angels who held the seven bulls filled with the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Baby Jesus comes as our little king, as our little husband, so that we can be made into his wife, right? Washed in his word, as it says in Ephesians, made without blemish by clothing ourselves with him. He took me in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God. It gleamed with the splendor of God. We, we Once we embrace Christ and his gift to us at Christmas, then we radiate his splendor in the world. Its radiance was like that of a precious stone, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed and on which the names were inscribed, the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. There were three gates facing east, three north, three south, and three west. The wall of the city had 12 courses of stones as its foundations on which were inscribed the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city had no need of a sun or a moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb. This is where I want to leave you as you meditate during Advent here on the coming of Christ. I invite you to meditate on the Christ child as our light. And this line here, that the glory of God gave the city light, for its lamp was the lamb. Baby Jesus comes in the stable in Bethlehem as our little lamb, as our Agnus Dei, as the unblemished lamb. 
that will be sacrificed for us on Calvary in order to save us from sin. And this holy lamb bleeding, you know, in his mother's arms in Bethlehem is our lamb. A child as our lamb. Not only does Christ hold that, that lamp, that lantern of the cross for us to see our way like a flashlight, but he himself, out of every pore of his body, radiates heaven because he's that word of God. And where his light goes, life goes. You cannot have the light of Christ without life. So if there's an area of your home of your heart where you feel darkness, I invite you to light a candle and to sit and to pray and ask Christ, the baby Jesus coming at Christmas to come as light into that place because he cannot come with his breath of light and not bring his life. And maybe he won't give you a million dollars if you're in debt, but he will give you a solution to every problem because he gives you life. His light and his life and his love are one united mystery that come forth from his little heart. And it begins as that Lamb of God in Bethlehem. It continues on the altar in the Eucharist of every Mass. It draws us into the resurrection and heaven and eternity. These are the wonderful mysteries that we are preparing to celebrate at Christmas, and yet Christ already reaches into our lives today on the 1st of December to offer us a glimpse of that light. You don't have to wait until Christmas to put up your Christmas lights. Jesus wants you to anticipate his coming by doing that. And every time you see the Christmas lights up places that you think of him as the light of the world. Our Lady was preparing for the coming of Christ in her birth, but from that first moment of the Annunciation where he, his heart beat under her breast, the light of the world already dwelt with her, preparing her for him to grow more and more in her and in the world. And so as we prepare, it's not like Christ is here at the end of 25 days from now, and we're here and we have to do all this preparation to receive it, uh-uh. The more his, his light is planted in us today as a little seed, the more that light grows, the more that message of Christmas grows. And then the more we can receive the fullness of the graces that he wants to give us on Christmas morning. So we ask, come Lord Jesus, come as our light. Help us not to fear you. Open our hands docilely, our hearts, our minds to your presence as a baby. Plant the seeds of your life and your love and your light within our lives, especially in the ordinary, in the mundane, in the problems, in the loneliness and the abandonment and the betrayal and the unsurety, in the sickness, in the poverty. Come and be with those who are abused, those whose lives are threatened in any way, those who are being mistreated. Come and bring the power of your light that scatters darkness, that scatters the force of sin and of evil. Use your light to refine us, to purify us, to make us holy so we can shine as lamps with you in heaven eternally as children of the light. We ask the Holy Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph who live this mystery so profoundly with you 2,000 years ago to be with us, to prepare us, and to nurture through their prayer for us this gift within our lives. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Come, Christ, be our light. Amen.